So, uh, so there's two questions. Um, I think the first one is that we want to hypothesize about what we're going to get done in 10 years, because the, the goal here is that uh, 10 years from now we're going to have another uh, conference and uh, talk about how we solved various things over those 10 years and the new mysteries that have emerged. Um, so, uh, so, so we want to think about um, what, what do we actually think we're going to figure out in the next 10 years. Um, so we're, we're going to put several things down and we're going to ask uh, participants afterwards or during to, um, to, uh, to put their initials down if they think that uh, that, they, that, that that will actually be achieved. Okay. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back and see, uh, see who was right and who was wrong. And to uh, be clear, that's, that you think it's going to be achieved, not that you are responsible for doing it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, second, the second question is, uh, the second question is, uh, what, what, what's our wish list? So maybe trying to come up with some priorities. So, um, I guess, okay, I guess, I guess I'll get started just, just to, uh, uh, address the, the first question. Um, uh, something that, uh, that I think that we're going to achieve in the next 10 years. Um, yeah, on Zoom, they're just wondering uh, where ah, we can okay. put initials. Yeah, uh, do we have do we have the link to the Google Doc? Let's just put it in the Slack. Oh, okay. Um, do you have? Okay, um, we will work on getting the link out to everyone. Okay, uh, <laughs> but for for now at least, we can uh, discuss um, verbally. Um, so. Uh, uh, what, what, what are you going to achieve in the next 10 years? I think... Okay, um, uh, I think something that we're going to achieve in the next 10 years is that we are going to uh, be able to have uh, convective boundary mixing models from 3D simulations that uh, that we think are actually correct, and which can be uh, implemented directly in 1D modeling, it might not match with observations, <laughs> but I think that it'll be correct. What else? All right. In theory, the lack, the link is in the Slack general channel. And if there's anyone who's in that channel and also in the Zoom call, could you copy it from there to the Zoom call chat? Uh, there's also uh, another comment from Pascal uh, saying, I suspect we will have figured out non-magnetic rotational mixing for weekly rotating stars. And thank you for posting the link. Hi, Vicky here. Um, I think we will have been able to explain how diffusion and atomic diffusion um, contributes to excitation of pulsations in many stars. Uh, I think that we can add uh, observational constraints of magnetic Name. field. Uh, Rafa Garcia. Uh, so observational constraints of magnetic field in the in the core of the red giants through uh, astro seismology. It's Dominic here. Can I can I expand that one? I would very much like, and I think is achievable in the next uh, five to ten years, the measurement in a main sequence star as well. Make it a separate bullet point. Those are two separate pieces of work. Uh, OK, 
Okay, uh, for the uh, diffusion, atomic diffusion, that's um, pulsations in? Stars in general. In stars, in stars, stars, yeah. Uh, this is Adrian Fraser. I think that uh, it's maybe inspired by that last one. Uh, we'll have uh, better idea, better models of thermohaline mixing efficiency given the magnetic field strength. And I'm not working on it, but I think we'll have better models of GSF angular momentum transport efficiency too. Um, hi, Meredith here. Um, so. Uh, I would like to, to aim for maybe um, 10 calibrators for the mixing length, whereas we have three now. So I think that we can uh, work that up to, to an order of magnitude improvement. <laughs> we, we means me, but also not me. So Pascal Garo asks, do you think you will have resolved the controversy on excitation of gravity waves by convection? Uh, more specifically, the spectrum as a function of convective properties. Bulk? Ten years? <laughs> Can you ask me in one year again? I, I I'm I'm not going to I don't know. I think I think we're going to figure it out in ten years. Uh, Vicky Antoji here. So I think we will have a good sample of stars for each um, spectral type. So from the OBA to all the way down to the M dwarfs, including temperatures, abundances, rotate, V sine I, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, much here again. So one thing that will definitely happen in the next 10 years, we'll get much better constraints on black hole spins from LIGO, and then I'm not sure we'll be able to make sense of them in 10 years, but. Yeah, uh, Rafa again. Uh, so I would like that Meredith uh, could expand a little bit the point on the 10 calibrators for MLT. So what do you want from the observers or the 3D modelers for defining better the, the calibrators? Uh, yeah, so um, in order to perform these, uh, Meredith, uh, calibrations, um, we basically need a really high number of independent observational constraints. So I think um, uh, astroseismology is going to be a big thing here. Um, and we also need interferometry for the same set of targets. Um, so if there's a way to kind of overlap test continuous viewing zones with um, interferometric target lists, that's going to expand the sample of possibilities um, in the largest way. Um, and so like basically the only ones that have everything you need to, to do this and make it easy are um, alpha sen A and B and the sun, um, which are obviously in a really uh, unique situation. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking for um, eclipsing binaries that are fully separated, that have interferometry, that have astroseismology. So when I say these things, observers tend to laugh at me and they're like, okay, cool. But if you can do that, um, then I can do this. Okay, yeah, I, I was going to say binaries with interferometry, bright stars, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, high resolution spectroscopy also, of course. Yeah, sure. If you have all the rest, that one is the, an easy one, right? Uh, so we have another question on Zoom from Pascal. Do you think we will have resolved the controversy slash problem with solar abundances? <laughs> we have some laughs in the room here. Yeah, I'm not voting for that one. Matteo Cantiello, I think that in the next 10 years we'll figure out the problem of uh, um, radial inflation in uh, low mass stars. And in the more massive regime, we also um, systematically explore energy transport in uh, stellar envelopes and understand the radial extension of more massive stars. We can touch here. I think in 10 years we will have the differential rotation rates for a significant, a significant number of stars based on test observations and plateau by then. 
And uh, just to be specific, that's radial differential rotation? Both. Both. Radial and latitudinal. There will be some for some stars. <laughs> ben Brown here. Um, I think that in 10 years, it's not implausible that we would have some idea from dynamo simulations of magnetic field morphologies with some stellar variable, either rotation, maybe with mass to any any constraints on the magnetic field morphologies from those? So this is more a wish list item, Falk Herwig. This is more a wish list item. I see that Amanda is on the Zoom call. Uh, <clears throat> so I, my wish list would be, and I'm thinking Amanda would maybe share that. Uh, that we resolve, that we develop a, a giant, an, an extra mixing understanding for giant stars on the RGB as well as on the AGB, uh, because I think that there are constraints from the AGB where uh, some of the mechanisms that we have been discussing here that work on the RGB don't necessarily work, but we have very good, uh, very strong evidence that there must be extra mixing on the AGB as well. The CEMP stars, these are the carbon enhanced metal poor stars, if you don't put some kind of extra mixing on the AGB, the CEMP stars should have carbon 12 to carbon 13 ratios, and Amanda can, make, can correct me if I'm wrong, but they should have uh, carbon 12 to carbon 13 ratios which are like 1,000 or 10,000, which is really not observed. There are like, I don't know, 10, 30, although the, the CMP stars on the main sequence. And so uh, I think that um, my wish list would be that we look at this extra mixing problem um, in a way that we look at RGB and AGB together. Yeah, and you can, uh, can add to either list, so. So, Rafa Garcia again, and to make a favor to Jen, so solving the breaking laws in solar light stars. That's wish list or will be? It will be done. It will be done. So, just to respond to Falk here, Amanda says, agreed. I would hope we can have a good theory of extra mixing in RGB and AGB envelope in 10 years. And thank you. We can touch here um, for the wish list. Predictions of stellar spots. <laughs> uh, Philip Edelman here. Uh, we've been talking about this dictionary of the jargon of the different terms in our community. I really hope we have something like that in 10 years, like through meetings like this one. I think that'd be really helpful. So, Rafa Garcia again. For the wish list uh, that the community managed to put a strong proposal for a stellar imager in a satellite, probably. Jamie Tyre, I'm going to bet that we're going to have at least 500 star evolved stars with core and surface rotation rates. Actually, I have two issues. Uh, one is a UV, UV spectral polarimeter in space. Oh, sorry, you, I think. Um, and another wish list um, would, would be uh, to have core sizes of uh, O stars, so from astro seismology. Uh, 
Um, I, I would have to look at Dominic, but um, so far it's only up to about 25 salamases, so I think maybe maybe with, with Plato this can be done, I think Dominic said. But we really need to know, if we want to understand uh, black hole formation, um, then we need to know the core sizes of, of these very massive stars. Uh, so can someone comment on why uh, that cannot be done right now? So this is Dominic. Uh, so we're data limited right now. So this is, uh, this is potentially something that we can go into the five to 10 year regime because the data are now available to do this. Uh, but because of the complications of massive stars, so winds, binarity, and all of the above that we've talked at this conference, because binarity has not been a main feature of this conference, uh, doing seismology of massive stars is actually quite difficult. Um, so it requires a team of people, and that's why we need to pay people to do this. In the my name is Matteo, and in the, uh, following up the suggestion of throw some spice here and there, I want to make a claim here that I hope is going to be disproved, but I'm going to claim that there's going to be a maximum mass about which is not possible to explore the core of massive stars with astro seismology. Um, and that's probably related to the problems that um, Dominic just mentioned, and in particular the existence of subsurface convective layers that might wipe out any signal coming from the core. And I hope this, I'm going to be disproved, but that's my claim. Uh, related to that, I'm just going to add uh, that I think we will have figured out where the low frequency variability comes from inside of 10 years. Hey, this is uh, Liam O'Connor, and uh, this is a super broad witch list item, but it seems like people would benefit a lot from more automated integration between the 3D models and the 1D models. Um, and like I said, super broad, but I know that from the MIS perspective, it's much easier to work with an analytic prescription for things like convection and rotation, mixing like theory. Um, but given that that's not always going to be possible with some of these super complicated systems, uh, we might just have to work with what we have. Um, Um, so, so this is Meredith, and in support of that, I would like to put on the wish list um, tenured jobs for everybody that works in modeling. Can't help on that one. Meredith says observers can have some too. That's your answer. I think this goes on the wish list, not on the things that will figure out, but a better understanding of the interplay between mass loss and rotation. <laughs> so you're betting we won't have figured out the relationship between mass loss and rotation. Okay. I think that's a prediction. We won't have figured that out. <laughs> Uh, Matteo again, uh, since we're in the wish list part of our uh, list. Um, I think that something I would love to see is for us to be the first community that only operates using open source codes for reproducibility and uh, the better uh, ability to, you know, share and reproduce uh, results. I know it's hard, it's a tall order for people who have been using code for a long time which are not open source. It's a lot of work to open source a code, but I really hope that we're going to get there. It will be a good example for the rest of the, the field. Uh, Evan Anders, I just also want to add to that not only codes, but also like the scripts that we use to do our science and our post processing and all of that. Savita uh, Mesa. So in the, yeah, I think it should be in the list of things we will achieve. Um, to um, 
to have a large sample of stars with uh, magnetic activity cycle and asteroid seismology. Uh, Pascal wants to add to the wish list a Daedalus summer program or a summer school. Daniel Aquane, uh, give us money and we'll do it. <laughs> or, or any suggestions of where to get that money? Ben, are you stretching or raising your hand? Okay. Go. Go ahead. Uh, so a few things from the chat. Uh, Pascal, I think, is suggesting a Kavli summer program in astrophysics or, or transport in stars. And then uh, Trevor Dorn Wallenstein uh, makes a prediction. So doable in 10 years, observational confirmation of the upper mass limit of uh, SN11P uh, wish list, uh, understanding of why that limit of uh, mass loss mixing or uh, direct collapse or other weird things. SN2P. So uh, type 2P is the supernova. Uh, IIP, I'm not familiar with that designation. The wish list was understanding of why why that limit is uh, is there. Huh. Uh, this is Adrian Fraser. Uh, I to my wish list, I would add uh, a Daedalus equivalent to that really cool Mesa Web tool uh, as like a tutorial and also like quick run thing. Uh, Vikian Toshi here. Um, my, for the wish list is the implementation of time-dependent convection treatment, non-local convection treatment, in the context of pulsations into MESA. You're not willing to bet that'll happen in 10 years? Um, along the same lines, um, a numerically stable uh, description of angular momentum transport and rotational mixing um, on the scale that we need for astroseismology. Well, hmm? uh, I, I think I need a little bit more brain power to do that. Okay, uh, Rafa Garcia again. Uh, wish list uh, to solve the uh, the surface effect in astroseismology. It's a wish. It's a good wish. I'm not betting on that one either. So Amanda has another wish list item, uh, and that is to define the super AGB star from observations uh, to help constrain the range of seven to ten solar masses. Uh, Evan Anders, this one might be achievable in 10 years. Uh, have an understanding of latitudinal differential rotation in convection zones uh, as a function of like Rossby number in MHD. Start off good and then, yeah. <laughs> People are allowed to be optimists. Uh, Matteo, um, I will be interested, I will hope that we'll get a better understanding of the origin of white dwarf magnetism in the next 10 years. And um, with that in mind, I'm going to advertise this uh, KTV program, which is happening a year from now, which is going to be devoted to the study of white dwarfs. So if you're interested in white dwarfs, check it out. Has someone bet on the number of latitudinal differential rotation measurements we'll believe yet? I'm going to say more than 10 is my bet for the number. But I'm not sure I'm going willing to go to more than 100.
Uh, so Pascal wants to add Gmodes in as thumb. And also I think a, a comment on uh, Evan's wish list item, which is a, I think that's more of a 50 year plan. I think the, well, it's a question mark, I think on the wish list. Pascal, correct me if, if not. I mean, I'm willing to, do you want to bet on uh, publishing that, Rafa? That people will believe you, or? <laughs> this is a joke. Uh, clarification, universally accepted G-modes in the sun. <laughs> Um, to again, I think an achievable goal, uh, it's a uh, um, numerical simulation of uh, uh, Taylor's fruit dynamo in stars. So, Rafa, again, going back to the G modes, uh, if we want to do it properly, it should be something like characterization of individual uh, G modes in a universally accepted <laughs> way. Uh, Joel Ong here, um, which is because I don't think this is going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, testable predictions for mode amplitudes in stochastically excited oscillators. Yeah, so, um, following up to Matteo, I would. Oh, sorry. Hulk. Uh, following up to Matteo's wish for open source, I would like to uh, suggest that we expand that to, uh, in the community, a commitment to sharing of uh, a, a commitment to community resources. And in our case, that means that you know, uh, doing simulations that really do require tens of thousands of cores, uh, the way we are sharing our resources is by putting quite a bit of work into sharing an, uh, an analysis framework where you can go and explore 3D data. Uh, and my wish list would be that, uh, and we have started some discussions along those lines, my wish list to the community would be that there is some uh, activity starting up maybe here at this meeting to, to take a ton of convection expressions uh, and test them and very validate them against uh, either our existing simulations that we have already posted on our virtual uh, research platform or to work with us to create uh, dedicated new experiments. There's some discussions that we have with this Mathieu and uh, Ibrahim and others, Philip, uh, and one could imagine, for example, to define as a community uh, a dedicated simulation that we think can be used to test TDC and we can then do that in very high resolution and, and post and make the run available in a way that anybody can analyze it and, and perform their tests. And, and that's a way, uh, I think, in which uh, we would express a commitment to sharing community uh, resources to the community. Um, hi, Meredith here again. Um, so, so for the sake of a little bit of spiciness, also, um, my my wish list uh, includes um, publicizing other stellar evolution codes um, that are not Mesa, making those open source as well. Uh, Joel again. Um, so this is also for the wish list, and it may be a bit controversial. Um, Julia. <laughs> Julia is in the programming language. I'm on the for side, but I can some I can see some resistance. But what are we for? Just like one standard language for both numerical processing, numerical calculations, and post processing. I can say. Um, Mathieu Renzo, another wish list item is that it becomes a standard in the Stellar Evolution community to do and publish resolution tests. 
Vikian Tochi here. Um, this is a, for the wish list for 20 years in the future. I uh, have a Kepler-like mission in the wavelength range from the UV to the near infrared and having multiple data points like mid-resolution. Maybe it's 50 years. So we have another uh, wish list, but also potentially possible in the next 10 years. Suggestion from Louis Amard. Uh, maybe some simulations giving a description that could be tested in stellar evolution codes of the magnetorotational instability in stars. Uh, Louis Amard. So, Rafa again, uh, the most important wish list, uh, wish uh, for all of us, to have a dictionary that we can talk the same language. Uh, because to start with, what the hell is Julia? Uh, Julia is like Python, just better. <laughs> I'm an IDL guy, so Python it's what nuts. <laughs> the joke in the room was that we should all revert to Fortran. I'm going to put in a bet, Jamie Tyre, that we will have a hundred thousand stars with ages to better than fifteen percent. Ten years. Well, Plato. We'll have tests for 10 years. 100,000, that's my bet. Uh, so Pascal thinks the MRI wish list item should be moved to a, a prediction in the next 10 years. Daniel Lequanel second that. Uh, Evan Anders, I, this is also a question to people because I can't remember what missions are happening. Isn't there going to be a mission that goes over the pole of the sun in the next decade? Yes. yes. Polar observations of the sun. <laughs> uh, Evan, can you say why you're interested in polar observations of the sun? Yeah, so like if the interior of the sun is like rotationally constrained, like we think it may be, that'll be a lot easier to see on the pole than it is on the equator where we are. That's the main reason I'm excited. So my, I have one more wish list for the field. Name? Falk. One more wish list for the field from Falk. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of an expansion of the comment I made before regarding AGB stars. Um, when we are talking about transport phenomena and mixing in these various regimes, these really have uh, huge implications and testable Predict, might make testable predictions in, uh, in, in late phases of cell evolution as well, where we have lots of uh, really useful constraints from nucleosynthesis, and where we also need more input from this community in terms of determining what the thermodynamic and mixing conditions are where the elements are made. One good example that has been described here a couple of times is the white dwarf uh, uh, evolution regarding the core helium burning and the carbon-12 alpha-gamma reaction rate, the white dwarf cooling rates depend sensitively on all of these things. And my wish list is um, we ha there is a very well-developed community uh, in nuclear astrophysics, uh, GINA, they have a frontiers meeting coming up next spring. There is a DOE proposal for a new center for nuclear astrophysics with multi-messengers. And my wish list would be that some people from this community would show up at the Frontiers meeting that is Gina's big 130 people uh, collaboration meeting and, and talk to a nuclear astrophysicist about constraints for the mixing models that we have, but also help that community better understand mixing in their modeling. So better connections, synergies between the nuclear astrophysics community and this community. 
Um, hi, Meredith again. Uh, so I think that in 10 years, we will still not know what's going on with lithium. Uh, it, Adrian Fraser, I, I, I'm not willing to bet on this. I just kind of wonder if other people are. Are, are we going to figure out the Cameron Fowler, like lithium enrichment, Cameron Fowler? Is that something that everyone thinks is going to be figured out? You can put an X to Meredith and see who bets on which. So Meredith is saying hers is, is a little bit broader than that. And so, uh, OK, I'm going to put in two bets. One, that we will have 10,000 uh, giants with lithium, carbon to nitrogen, C12, C13, and astroseismology. And the other one I'm going to put in is that we are going to find a solar-like oscillator red giant with a mass above four. I also, sorry, this is Liz Abenier. Um, this is more like a wish, is that we open up a little bit more to new ways of analyzing data, such as machine learning. I know we haven't talked about a lot um, this week, uh, but I know in other fields in, in astronomy, people are using it more and more, and it's making, giving good results. Um, so I, it's more like a wish, long-term wish that, that we we go a little bit further down that road. Uh, Mateo here. I feel like nobody brought up the prediction that we're going to solve rotational mixing in stars. And I think the reason is that it seems like a very complicated problem. So it's a little depressing. So maybe on the wish list, I would like the community to think very hard about observational tests that might constrain the problem of additional mixing in stars better than we've done so far. Uh, so Pascal has another wish list item, uh, a large list of real solar twins with great astro seismology. Hi, Vicky here. It's a wish list, is to be put on the wish list that we make somehow sure that people don't just use analysis tools or, or software in general as a black box, but really understand what's, what they're doing. Uh, Joel here. Um, this is for the wish list. Um, Astro-seismic data analysis for solar-like for um, solar -like oscillations using techniques not inherited from helioseismology. I Vicky again here from the observational side, all these numbers of stars, like 10,000, 100,000, or whatever we said, they should all have interferometric radii. I know it's not going to be possible, but as many as possible. Tim Cunningham here. Um, a prediction. I think within 10 years, we'll have a large enough sample of metal polluted white dwarfs with high resolution spectroscopic abundance measurements that we can constrain additional mixing processes in the surface layers of these white dwarfs. But if it's not done in 10 years, you can bump it down to the wish list for the next 10 years. Um, Timothy van Reet, KU Leuven. Um, updated opacity tables for the wish list. I, I don't think that that's going to happen in 10 years. There's a not mic to comment asking what about nuclear reaction rates? Uh, 
Daniel Quinet. Um, uh, rotation uh, with um, uh, pulsation mode calculations. So uh, putting rotation into gyre, not using the traditional approximation. It's going to be done in the next 10 years. Not, not specifically gyre, but at least the open source code that people are using. I'm willing to bet we're still using gyre in 10 years. So, Rafa again, uh, in the wish list, uh, solve the identification problem of subgiants for mixed modes. Vicky here again. It's not a scientific wish, but having, having conferences without face masks. You're not willing to bet on that? <laughs> Her answer was not at the moment. Uh, Evan Anders, uh, I don't remember if this has been said, but something like MLT that, and this is a wish list thing, uh, that doesn't disagree with dynamical simulations in places where we know it. Yeah, just, I'll just say that. Yeah, doesn't disagree with dynamical simulations. Uh, Daniel, can I, yeah, uh, 3D sims was, I think, an important part, part of that. Uh, Adrian Fraser, and and I don't, I'm just kind of laying the spice flow. Uh, do other people think that we're going to still be using MLT in 10 years? Yeah. Yep, okay. I'm willing to put my dollar on, we're still using MLT. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's one I don't know, the Evan Bauer. Um, don't know whether it should go on the wish list or the expectation, but let's say a factor of 50 more computing powder, power for each individually and as a field. So that would be roughly Moore's law. Do we believe that will still happen or is it gone now? Um, I, this is Meredith, um, I, I predict and, and hope that the panels in, in future conferences start to look more like the demographics of this one that you carefully put together. Uh, I have a, a, another item for the wish list, which is that uh, Paul Falk. Falk. So my wish list is my wish list item is that Paul will be successfully porting PPM Star to the new DOE Aurora machine, which will multiply the resolution and the ability to do big runs for us. Is that a wish list, or you think it's going to happen in the next ten years? The room says Aurora won't exist in 10 years. Also, that sounds like a prediction. Binder Stuparty, uh, it's a prediction in the next 10 years. Maturity of- Hey, somebody speaking. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In the next 10 years, I guess, uh, oh, this is Bindas Tripathi and uh, maturity of nonlinear asteroid seismology that could be contrasted with observational data. That's a BT, BT. Vicky again, I think I have to go again with observations, measurements of magnetic fields for along the entire HR diagram for a significant number of stars. Uh, 
uh, Jared Goldberg, um, a better understanding of subsurface convection zones and replacing MLT++ for massive stars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mattel here, I'm making a prediction that in 10 years we won't use MLT++. <laughs> Vicky here, more interdisciplinary programs like this one. Um, good question. Wish list? Uh, Evan Anders piggybacking off of that, both between like modelers and observers, but also between like astrophysicists and geophysicists and yeah, people who do other planets, mostly this planet that we are on right now. There's another program going on right now on the Earth's climate. The people are here. Uh, this is my wish list, support for boring work. No, the idea is eventually you're going to put your initials up to them, and in 10 years, whoever has the most initialed correctly wins the prize. A bottle of wine, <laughs> probably. Maybe a bottle of whiskey. I don't know. Purchased by Daniel. <laughs> um, I'm 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 going to add a prediction, which is that we're going to know whether or not uh, core breathing pulses happen. Okay. Uh, I think that we'll still be. Uh, struggling with incentive problems for uh, infrastructure and software in 10 years. Oh, Adrian Fraser. There was a request for a clarification. Do we lose points for incorrect guesses? <laughs> yes. That's from Trevor. I want to say you only lose half a point for an incorrect guess. And you lose nothing for a guess that was too ambiguous to determine if it was correct or not. Vicky here. It's not a, anything that should go on either, actually. It could be an additional um, feature where we can send messages to ourselves or to the younger generation in the future, in 10 years, based on what we have learned so far. So the link to this document, so it's in the Slack, maybe we can also email it to the conference participant list as well, so everyone has access to it. So in the time capsule thing, Rafa Garcia, uh, yeah, I think that we have to name Rafa, is it? Where is that? Uh, I think that we have to remember the people in 10 years that we didn't remember, we didn't like the MLT.
Um, this is Meredith, and I like MLT. That's all I want to say. Uh, this is Liam again. I predict that GPUs are going to become more mainstream in modeling throughout the next 10 years, especially I mean, in scientific computing. Uh, this is Meredith again. Um, my wish list is for better, um, like, computational science training for astronomers. That was a wish, Adam, not a prediction. I'll put as a wish list item, oh, Paul Woodward, a wish list item that GPUs will not be mainstream in 10 years. <laughs> Do we have any predictions about convection up there? I think we had a lot of wish lists. So my a convection related prediction, Falk, a convection related <laughs> prediction <laughs> is that we will have a, a good understanding of uh, convective reactive uh, events in late stages of uh, stars and the nucleosynthesis. So I'm Lan. Um, my wish list is um, is the next tense here. We under, understand better the um, stellar rotation, rotation of stellar and magnetic field of stellar, and to see how it's affecting to the radio radio velocity of the detection of the exoplanets or sphere thin. Yeah. LN, LN, is that right? Yeah, LN, yeah. Are, are there any requests for topics that you'd like someone to make a prediction or a wish list item for? Like, um, you got to mention convection. But. Anything else? It's a little marginal, Matteo here, a little marginal to this um, meeting and program. We haven't talked much about it, but one big wish of mine is that we solve the problem of common envelope evolution in stars. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's just some general sentiments of gratitude on the Zoom channel. Uh, a few people have had to go, but they wanted to uh, thank everyone for the discussions and the talks, and they've uh, enjoyed being able to participate. Falk? I have, uh, I have a wish list item uh, that is essentially what we discussed with Meredith the other day. Uh, she, uh, which is, uh, I would love to see some Mesa developers create uh, a, a, a version, a, ver a simplified version of Mesa using the modules that has exactly the same microphysics like uh, that most or many hydro codes have, such as PPM star, so that we can directly study the effect of dimensionality. And so that would be wonderful if someone would put that together for everybody to use. I'm going to, Jamie Tyre, I'm going to add to that. I'd love it if the atmosphere people use the same microphysics as the 1D stellar evolution people, which I don't think is usually true.
Uh, hi, Meredith again. So I think this is a prediction. Um, I think that we are going to rely a lot on machine learning in the next 10 years, and I don't necessarily know if that's a good thing, but I think it will happen. I'm going to add to the wish list that like us to understand uh, saturation of activity at high rotation rates. I feel like I'm willing to predict that we're going to have a theory for saturation that's accepted by at least 60% of people. I think that's the level it's going to be at, though. <laughs> well, how can I get my bottle of alcohol if I'm not specific? Any, any more? Persia. Starting to run out, it seems like we're, we're not going to keep you hostage <laughs> till the official end of the session, but just wanted to make sure that everyone, everyone has a chance to put down their ideas. I don't have any claims here. I'm just soliciting space. Does anybody want to make claims about like funding or faculty positions for, oh, this is Adrian. Does anybody want to make speculations about funding or faculty positions over the next 10 years for the people doing the kind of science in this room. Uh, so Adrian's uh, asked everyone if, if anyone would, would make a prediction about funding in the next 10 years. So what, what will the state of funding be? in 10 years for, 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 for people in our field. Evan Anders, on, on the bright side, there's like a whole lot of software engineering jobs that pay really well. <laughs> in fact, my, my prediction is that, uh, Jared Goldberg, uh, my prediction is that uh, if the community isn't careful, they're going to lose all of their best code developers to such software jobs that pay really well. Uh, Michael Pearson, I predict like within the next 10 years we'll have at least core masses of at least 200 OP stars. At least 200. OP. <laughs> You're welcome to make more challenging predictions. <laughs> So I have a, a prediction, Rafa. Uh, in Europe, if Plato is working, there will be a bunch of uh, new positions, permanent ones for people in the community. Um, as a response to Falk. Uh, as a response to Adrian, uh, I think the other day we had the discussion about you know uh, maintaining small scale efforts versus sort of these big ticket items, and I think that generally speaking, the stellar physics community's theory observations can be quite optimistic in the sense that uh, stellar physics in the last five to ten years, the way I see it, has really become more relevant to more astronomy than it used to be, and that is simply because we're learning more in the, the you know, planet science, LIGO, uh, uh, even you know, galactic archaeology, um, cosmological, chemis, uh, chemical uh, evolution. All these fields rely on solar physics, and that, I think, has been recognized by, by a lot of people. The, 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 the 
research areas were much more siloed than they are now. What it means for our community is that we have to go out and talk to all of these people um, and also understand that, you know, ultimately the funding in the field will will depend on how we're comparing to, to other fields. And so that's why you need these big efforts and the big ticket items and the big simulations and the, and sort of working to get together. Uh, and so I, if we do that and, and reach out to these other efforts, LIGO and so on and so forth, um, pair instabilities and stuff like that, um, there, it, I think it's pretty pretty bright future potentially. Uh, Vicky here. So it's more a question to the people around here. Do we not expect the JWST will solve anything? <laughs> um, hi, this is Meredith from Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's going to go up this year. <laughs> that's that's a prediction. There, there was a similar uh, wish list slash prediction in the, the Zoom, which is it, it has been launched in the next 10 years, question mark. <laughs> uh, that was from Louis Amard. And then, love the spice, love the spice. Uh, Trevor Dornwallenstein also uh, makes a spicy prediction that makes him sad, which is that uh, even if it does launch, something will be broken on JWST. <laughs> he didn't say it will be broken, he said something will be broken. So, uh, Joel, I'm going to block the optimism by uh, having a wish list item for uh, backup plan if we run out of money as a fuel. Uh, a wish list item for a uh, backup plan for if we run out of money as a field. Mateo here. So my prediction is that in 10 years, the relative funding for the field of stellar physics, following a little bit what Falk was saying, will going to be uh, larger, um, but it won't be. But it's going to be smaller in 20 years. Adam wants to know if that's real or nominal. Uh, okay, Evan Bauer. Uh, my prediction is probably not right away, but within 10 years, though, there will be new types of jobs for people doing software development in this field. Uh, Vicky here again on the wish list, I guess, that more space agency are launching satellites that do the type of observations that we require, not just NASA and ESA. So they'd launch a Hitomi that doesn't break. <laughs> Any other thoughts, predictions, Evan? Uh, so I'm pretty sure this is like a wish list thing. I'm pretty sure a lot of this actually already exists, but just like that there were great reviews on all of the topics that we've been talking about in this program so that anybody who wanted to dive into one of the topics had an obvious starting place. So Rafa Garcia, <clears throat> so my wish list thing is that in 10 years time when we'll be looking to the sky, we will actually look to stars and not to satellites crossing everywhere. Um, hi, this is Meredith again. So 
a wish list item I have, but uh, I hope this will be true, is that there's there's more respect from theorists for what observers do, because um, it's really difficult, and, and there's more respect from observers for how hard stellar modeling is. Maybe one or two more or less thoughts before we close out. Adam, anything? Oh, that's kind of a closing one. I hope we are all together in 10 years when we open the time capsule. Vicky here, I also hope that Google um, Drive will exist in 10 years. <laughs> so we can actually read this. We're, we're going to print it out and uh, bury it in the garden. So don't worry about that. <laughs> okay. I think maybe with that, we should close it out. So thanks everyone for participating in the discussion, for making this conference very exciting for everyone. And um, see you in 10 years. Yeah, and we really appreciate all of you bearing with us on the adventure of this many discussion panels, which Lars did not believe was going to work. And I would like to also thank the organizers, Falk. <laughs> I would like to thank the organizers for just putting together a wonderful meeting. Uh, many of you have done this. We, we all know how much work it is. And it was just a wonderful meeting. And thank you very much uh, to the organizers for all the effort and the cool stuff. Cool meeting. And and one, one last point that um, we couldn't have done it alone. Uh, we also really want to thank the KTP staff, uh, technical staff, and everyone for making this happen, uh, making our very strange request for discussion panels and having people join us remotely, in person, slides, no slides, having that be so seamless. Um, that has really been uh, amazing work on their part, and we're very grateful for and that. And for Claudia, so. every time we change the schedule, and it, it, a lot of work went in on their side. You're now free. <laughs>